Hello, I'm Sahel Mirza, and welcome to episode one of season two of Voices of Care. And I'm joined today by Matthew Kershaw, Chief Executive of Croydon Health Services NHS Trust. In Voices of Care, we seek to get to the heart of the issues that are facing the health and social care sector by speaking to leaders that are truly enabling the healthcare workforce of the future. In this episode, we'll be covering the tumult and transformation in the sector, issues around workforce and waiting times, and the small matter of turning the dial on health inequalities. To help me deal with that, uh, no pressure by the way, uh, welcome Matthew, uh, it's great to have you here. Thank, great to be here, thank you Sal. I wonder, before we get into the substantive issues, if you may just spend a few minutes giving us a bit of a picture about the work of the Trust. It's got quite a distinctive demography that it serves, and it also comprises both acute and community provision. That's right. Uh, So Croydon Health Services uh, NHS Trust is a busy uh, acute and community combined trust uh, in South London. We serve the borough of Croydon uh, and are very proud to do so. Uh, Croydon is a borough, 400,000 people, and is uh, very diverse. So we have over 50% of our population are from a black, Asian, and minority ethnic background. Uh, we have significant health inequalities. We have uh, a very high proportion of uh, the population in the core 20 plus 5 uh, most deprived uh, sort of segment of the population of the country. Um, and uh, with the diversity, the health inequalities and some of the social challenges, it does bring some specific needs. But it also is a hugely vibrant uh, place. Uh, and I've worked in the health service for over 30 years and it's the most enjoyable work that I've done uh, and that's in large part due to the location of where we work and the population we serve and the staff uh, that we employ and we employ about 4,000 staff uh, and as you say we provide uh, a range of DGH uh, acute services uh, but also uh, a strong community arm as well uh, with all the range of community services and a big part of what we're trying to do is integrate our care both within hospital and community services together um, but uh, also across health um, and between health and care. Fantastic. And we'll dive into some of those uh, topics. Uh, You talked about your 30 years uh, plus uh, in the sector. Now you you bring a huge amount of experience, not just leadership, but you work with the Department of Health, you work with mm. the CQC, uh, King's Fund. Um, it's not that long ago that uh, Jeremy Hunt, as chair of the Select Committee, said this was the worst workforce crisis mm. he'd ever seen. You've just come out of a winter a few months ago where you said it was probably the hardest mm. uh, winter you've experienced. Can you just flesh out just how challenging it is? The, the headlines are a 7.3 million elective list, big vacancies. Mm. I don't need to repeat the numbers, but just from your experience... Uh, just how challenging is the landscape? Yeah, I mean, it, it is. Uh, it, it's, it's exacting, I think it would be fair to say. Um, and for staff who work in the service, um, there's been a combination of pressures, I think, that have added to that challenge. So we've obviously had the pandemic and we shouldn't underestimate the impact that that's had, um, both going into it, during it, and the recovery thereafter. Uh, that is definitely something that is... I think part of the context of what we're currently in. If you add to that uh, straight out from the pandemic into what felt like and sort of continues to feel a bit like a perpetual winter uh, with the emergency and urgent care pressures um, and load on top of that then uh, industrial action and the cost of living crisis, it's lots of things that add to the pressures that are already inherent within the health service for the workers, for the staff, uh, for those of us who are committed to working in the health service. We know it's not an easy ask um, but some of those factors I think have definitely added to the challenge. Uh, that, that being said um, the NHS and the NHS staff are, are amazingly resilient um, and in each of those issues people have stepped up and responded fantastically and I'm very proud to be a part of that workforce. Um, but um, uh, that's something that you can trade on too much sometimes, uh, the individual resilience and the commitment and desire of staff. We've got to make sure as a, as a health service and broader as a country that we look after those staff, that we get recruitment and retention better, uh, that the well-being and health of our staff uh, has to be a priority. Um, uh, and we're doing a lot to try to address that and clearly much more that we can do. No, I look forward to speaking about your strategy which you've just adopted. Touching upon industrial action, there's been some progress in resolution but not completely within the nursing cohort. 
doctors. How is that impacting the system and also in terms of the operation of the trust? Because it's, it's of course, something that you have to now factor in in terms of your planning. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh on one level, uh, the disruption uh, and the cancellations of elective activity, because that's been the net impact, is that we've maintained uh, a level of uh, emergency care services, and quite rightly that's essential, but by we've done that by stopping other things, elective procedures, teaching, training, uh, research, other aspects of what the health service does. And, and so that impact we have to plan to recover that and get that back over the next few uh, weeks and months. Uh, and obviously, the more of that you have, the more difficult it is. Uh, it's a it's a balance, of course, because um, as I've said to staff uh, throughout this process, um, you know, I respect their right to strike and will continue to do so. But I have a responsibility to ensure we provide a safe service to our population so uh, we do respect staff's uh, right to do that but we also need to make sure and have done so far uh, that we've been able to provide that safe service the longer it goes on obviously the cumulative impact of that can uh, make it harder Um, uh, and so uh, my conclusion would be uh, as soon as possible I would hope that the parties involved, which clearly isn't me as an individual chief executive of, a, of an organisation, but that the parties involved find a resolution and we can move on. Uh, absolutely. You've, you've, you've chosen the hell of a five years to be at the helm since you took over in 2018. Just broadening the picture, you touched upon the integrated nature of the services provided. I think uh, Croydon has been providing community services over a decade now, mm. 2011. Mm. A- and that subject of integration is one that's close to your heart. I think uh, you're still a visiting fellow at King's Fund. You worked at the King's Fund where you wrote extensively around this. Um, and I think you were on record as saying for that to work, integration truly to, to work, you needed three things. You needed uh, good relationships. You needed governance, proper governance, which we hope the Health and Care Act has now enshrined on a statutory basis. And, and thirdly, uh, in your own candid way, you've got to make sure people actually do something. Yes. And I want to highlight, if we may, what have you seen on the ground in terms of integration and what promise does it hold in terms of workforce collaboration, because that's really an important element that yeah. puts this together. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're yeah. interesting to have stuff quoted back that you've <laughs> written, because I, I would I would con- continue to say that those three ingredients are crucial. Um, I would say the getting on and doing something and having good relationships that allow that to happen need to be at the forefront. The governance needs to be there, but it needs to be catching up with the doing and the relationships because otherwise you can get caught into creating a lovely diagram of how this is all going to work. But for the population and for the staff, the topic that you've asked me about, that doesn't mean so much. Mm. Um, What they want to know is how does it feel and is it different? Does that make it better for patients and better for staff? And my strong belief is that the more integrated the services are, the better chance there is uh, of providing the best quality of care and the best opportunity and experience for staff. That, that's my honest belief. Uh, and so an example mm. uh, from our own patch in Croydon, uh, we've run for some years now something called Integrate, Integrated Community Networks. Uh, and this is an opportunity uh, or a mechanism whereby we bring health staff um, from across uh, a range of services along with social care uh, colleagues and the voluntary sector uh, and other uh, colleagues from local authorities and bring them and work them and create an environment where they can work together looking after a section of the population in Croydon and Croydon is quite a disparate borough yep. if you're in the south of the borough um, uh, then uh, you're in uh, uh, sort of the north of Surrey and it feels like that if you're in the north of the borough uh, in Thornton Heath it feels very much like in a London uh, and therefore the population needs are quite different and integrated community networks where we can bring primary and secondary uh, community services together with mental health and uh, the care sector looking at a population and saying what are the needs of that specific population what does Matthew Kershaw who's a patient in that area need specifically because that will be different to what Sahel might need uh, in another part of the population and we're trying to flex our services by bringing people together and getting them to look and focus on that population and that that I think is a great example of how integrated care uh, can really make a difference to the populations that we serve. And also it serves I guess the career aspirations and the richness of experience for the staff themselves across what have previously been if it's fair to say 
siloed approaches to care? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, one of the things I say a lot uh, when I do trust induction uh, every other Monday, I say, you know, one of the opportunities of an integrated way of working is the breadth of uh, experience that you can get. You can move around doing a whole load of different jobs, but in the same uh place in Croydon um, because the barriers for moving are much lower uh, and I think that is an opportunity and an advantage um, uh, and uh, it's something that we're definitely trying to push. Absolutely. Uh, just touching upon London, it's a, it's a unique market. Uh, people have described it as a, a great training ground for uh, staff. Uh, it brings its own challenges and opportunities. Just want to flesh out how that's impacted the, the, the London environment in terms of retention and recruitment and also the how you've seen place-based approach to care in London because it's very distinctive um, beginning to show a, a results yeah I mean that, the the, uh, the London effect it's definitely there you know I've, I've worked outside of London and inside of London um, uh, I, I prefer the inside London and uh, that's a personal choice um, but there is you know obviously there's a need and a great opportunity that side as well but there is definitely a London effect it's a bit of a draw um, uh, for lots of people um, uh, and I think that's an advantage that we can that we can build upon. We've also got an awful lot of people here, uh, so the the sort of the, the the market that you're working with is significant. There are challenges. Uh, the costs. Uh, I don't mm. think we should underestimate. Um, uh, and certainly, you know, at the moment, the cost of living crisis um, is definitely adding to that. And obviously, we have the industrial action that sort of sits alongside that. A lot of those things uh, are sort of magnified uh, in London. But I'd say on balance, the opportunities and the advantages of the capital um, outweigh those challenges. Uh, and it is a fantastic city to, to work in. Uh, but very, very different. Uh, so you're in Croydon, it feels quite different to if you're in Kingston um, or Richmond uh, or uh, Westminster. So I think uh, it also provides that breadth and that opportunity and that diversity, which I think is a strength in Croydon and a strength in the capital uh, as a whole. Um, you were asking a, a second question. Do yeah, the, in terms of place, place-based yes. care in London, because obviously that is the zeitgeist that we're talking about, mm. community-based. We're seeing this transformation, obviously envisaged by the long-term plan, of more clinical hospital-like treatment in people's homes and communities. Mm. That brings a pressure and an opportunity in terms of the nature of the staff and the provision you're providing. Yeah, it does. Uh, and we've done a lot of work uh, to try to... Uh, continue that move out of hospital. Another example I'd give is uh, Virtual Wards, mm. um, which is an initiative that uh, we're running uh, in South West London. In fact, Croydon runs the, the central hub, which provides additional monitoring to allow patients who, you know, five years ago or even less, uh, might have uh, been in hospital for you know a week and now they might come for a day, but then they're at home being monitored uh, virtually. Um, that's a fantastic development supported by technology, but more importantly, supported by qualified, experienced staff uh, who are working in a remote, uh, uh, peripatetic type uh, approach, as our community staff do all the time. And I think that brings with it definite benefits for the patients uh, and for the system, because, of course, it frees up capacity that we can use for other things. But it also brings real opportunities to staff. I've spoken to the staff who are involved in that. And these are all very experienced people who've worked in the health service. Lots of them worked in hospitals, some have worked in community services. But the opportunity to do something as innovative and as different as that ha has definitely motivated them and has helped us in terms of recruitment and retention. So I think there are benefits to exactly that sort of thing. And just slightly touching upon, I know we're, we're talking about Croydon at the NHS here. I just want to take the opportunity because uh, you've been one of the hospitals selected to expedite the idea of stopping beds being occupied when they don't need to be community care, the nexus with social care, which of course is part of the work that you're doing as an integrated trust. Um, I want to just touch upon the social care workforce mm -hmm. because the importance of their training, and the esteem that, that they're held in is not just important, quite rightly, in of itself for the social care but it has a profound impact on your own provision at oh, the NHS. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you can separate the two. And certainly in my environment in Croydon, we try not to. So it's the health and care workforce uh, that I talk about because um, uh, they are two sides of the same coin. Um, and to have this distinction between too strong, I think, is is not right. Now, clearly, there are different jobs, um, but they are all, they're different jobs 
in the same uh, environment for the same output, which is to try to, in the Croydon context, provide the best care we can to the 400,000 people who live in Croydon. And a lot of that will be to do with health, a lot of it will be to do with social care. And the closer that that is maintained, the better it is for patients, the better it is for the system, and the greater the opportunities are for the staff. So we have, as I say, things like the integrated community networks, we've created combined teams, Front Runner, which is the programme that you're talking about, mm. we're the only place in London that's uh, following that programme, one of the six in the country. That's to look at the discharge process, um, but not discharge as a, right, well, we must get these people out of hospital to allow <laughs> the hospitals to work better. It's about getting people in back into the community and therefore the importance of the social care aspect of that is huge. So we are talking about blending roles um, mm. where we have health and care staff essentially both doing the same job they might have come from a background of social care or health care but actually what we're looking for them to do is be people who can help progress the care of a patient out of the hospital into their community and a blended role and a hub where those staff come together and work in a single place we think is uh, really quite exciting and could be I think one of the things for the future for health and care in this country. No absolutely. Um, Delving a little bit further now into your clinical strategy which you've adopted for 2023 to 2028 um, learning people uh, culture leadership is really vital. Um, I just wanted to touch upon that the importance of culture we've had the NHS staff survey which has had a, a varied outcomes across the system. Um, you've talked about resilience. Um, just how important and what initiatives have you seen in terms of supporting for it to be a great place to work? Because that's the aspiration on your strategic outcome. Indeed it is. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we talked about it right at the start, the challenges that mm. staff in the service have been through over the past few years. Um, and that's uh, definitely the context within which we work. Uh, within that, uh, if you look at that, the staff survey results for us, we, you know, we've seen some steady improvement, uh, which we're pleased about. Um, but uh, I think it would be fair to say we have a long way to go as an organisation, and mm. I think the health service does overall because you know people are quite tired um, uh, and they've had an, you know, experiences that, that will have impacted them. Um, and I think you can't ignore that. What you don't want to do is sort of get hamstrung by that mm. and feel that you know, it's all doom, gloom and despair and there's nothing that can be done to make it better because that's absolutely not the case. Uh, and actually, ultimately, it's not about coming up with some very clever new way of working. It's about treating people as you'd want to be treated yourself, with respect, uh, to engage people, to listen, to ask the people who are actually involved in providing the care what they want to develop, how they want to do it, what their ideas are for improvements, because ultimately they're the people who know it better than, you know, as the chief executive, it's my job to oversee that, but do I know how every bit of our organisation works the best? Absolutely not. Um, and doing things like engaging and listening and asking people for their input and leadership um, is sounds easy. It's all, of course, more complicated, but it is absolutely uh, the right thing to be done. Um, so I think there's a big aspect about that side of it. Mm. I think there is increasingly, and I reflect back on, you know, my 30 years in the service, uh, you know, the health and well-being offer that we give to staff. You know, if I think back to when I started, there wasn't anything. Um, uh, I mean, the biggest health and well-being offer was the social club that existed on every <laughs> hospital site where people used to go for a drink uh, at lunchtime or after work. Mm. Th those things don't exist anymore, but we are looking to offer a whole range of, you know, we have support programmes, we have mental health first aiders, we have the, uh, a programme where people can phone in 24 hours a day, seven days a week to get to support advice about a challenge that they might have at work or indeed uh, outside of work in their in their home lives uh, and things like that I think do make a difference um, uh, but ultimately it comes down to how you're looked after by your manager whether you feel valued and respected whether you feel like you can contribute positively to what's going on in the organization and that you're remunerated fairly and that the working to conditions are right and those are the things that you know we're trying to do the bits that we manage uh, well um, but it's definitely a it's a journey uh, and we are making a, you know progress in some areas but in other areas it feels really tough and that's the honest answer and that's why you know my job is to carry on with that and continue to look to make it better every day uh, uh, and some days 
I feel like I've been successful and moved it on. <laughs> and other days it feels like we've gone backwards a bit. And that's, you know, don't give up. You've got to be resilient in my job. And that's what you've got to keep coming back and, you know, working with the staff and asking them what is working and what isn't working and, and build on that and make progress for the future. Absolutely. And I think one of the distinctive features of the workforce, if I've got this right, uh, at the Trust, uh, is that there's a significant proportion, perhaps a distinctively uh, significant proportion, that actually live locally that's not always the case in uh, NHS trusts and does that have an impact it's uh, you know treating your own is it, does yeah. that have a dynamic oh, in terms of massively, fulfillment massively uh, in Croydon 70% give or take of our staff live in the borough that is a huge number um, uh, if you're in central London that number is significantly lower than that um, and so as I say when I talk to staff I'm actually also talking to the population that we mm. serve because they're living next door to their, you know, their patients, their friends, their families, who are also being treated in the organisation, and that does change the dynamic a bit. It makes the stakes a bit higher. Um, it feels uh, very close, uh, and you know, it's a bit like a family. So when families work well, <laughs> there that that is the strongest um, uh, form you can have. When families don't, uh, then it can be really quite tricky. Uh, and so that is something that uh, is always in my mind, that we are uh, an organisation that is providing essential services to our local population. And a lot of those people are our own staff. And as a consequence, our staff are also the biggest ambassadors uh, for the organisation. So if they're feeling positive about what's going on, so will the population and vice versa so yeah it definitely has an impact it's something in our minds all the time and we try to be very present in the place uh, you know the uh, uh, Croydon or health services and organization we try not to be sort of distinct from and separate to uh, our local population we want to be part of it and with them and that's why we try and make sure our connections out there are strong. And that will also have a quite a big impact because you talked earlier about the diversity mm. uh, in terms of uh, uh, eth ethnic diversity, because that, of course, is a high priority under the NHS People Plan and more broadly uh, to reflect within at all levels in the organisation, and that's an iterative process, yeah. uh, that diversity uh, in terms of inclusion. Yeah, I mean, we try to reflect that in everything that we do in terms of all of our recruitment uh, processes. And we have recruitment uh, inclusion specialists uh, who sit on panels at a certain level to, to make sure that the right questions are being asked. And we're trying to recruit people who see that diversity as a strength and an opportunity, uh, because that's absolutely what it is. Uh, it makes Croydon what it is. The diversity is... Uh, broader and deeper than anywhere I've ever worked um, and as a consequence it's uh, the 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 excitement and the opportunity that brings is, is is huge it does also bring some specific challenges in terms of making sure the services we provide are reflective of the different needs of the population that we serve so if it was you know I could look back at jobs I've done elsewhere mm. and they're, they're no, no way as uni demographic these days but I compare when I was chief exec in Salisbury to being the chief executive in Croydon. And they are completely different jobs uh, because of the population diversity that is in Croydon. And that makes it, for me, uh, even more of a, of a challenge and an opportunity. And uh, uh, and we need to make sure that we follow through on that for, for everybody. Well, he healthcare quintessentially is, is, is always local uh, for that reason. Exactly. A couple of final points, just to um, take a wider lens. Mm -hmm. um, your own experience, extensive. Um, I don't want to remind you it's been 30 years but it's <laughs> extensive yeah. it, it looks like it as well <laughs> most of the time um, you, you did work with Health Education England um, all the stats are showing that we're going to need more clinicians and non-clinicians mm -hmm. social care 480,000 430,000 yeah. NHS we are seeing people leave voluntarily in yes, significant are. numbers that's going to require not just the cultural uh, infrastructure you've talked about but also perhaps more innovation in terms of how we train and a variegated pathway to allow people to enter the sector. Are you seeing signs of that and how important is that going to be? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, essential is the short answer to that question. Uh, and I mean, again, if I link it into the Croydon context, mm. so we have 400,000 people who live in Croydon uh, and we have the youngest um, boa in London, the largest number of uh, people under 18 live in Croydon. That's our future workforce. If 70% mm -hmm. of our staff come from the borough yep. and we've got the youngest borough in Croydon, then part of our job is to connect with schools, 
higher education facilities um, and the population in general and say the health service, the health and care service is a place that you can come and have a fantastic career, do an amazingly important job and be well looked after in the process. And so apprenticeships and yep. lots of different things to get uh, young people into the health service I think is absolutely where we need to be going. Now we've made real progress in nurse apprenticeships. Um, uh, we've seen a huge uh, development in that area. We need to build on that and look at that in other areas, therapists, um, clinician, uh, other clinicians, uh, uh, doctors uh, and others. Uh, but also there's hundreds of other jobs. You know, we have a big estates and facilities team. Yep. You know, what are the opportunities for our local population to get into those sorts of jobs? You know, the managerial uh, work that we do. W what are those opportunities for local people? And so doing apprenticeships, training schemes to get direct access, not just through the established routes, uh, is going to be uh, one of the things that I think will mark out successful organisations in the future. Those people who do that and make that connection and get that supply of workforce uh, will do much better than those that don't. And that will also allow perhaps a, a, a democratisation hmm. of, of access. And that will, you talk a lot about partnership, of course, as part of your strategic objective. Um, that will include working across local authorities, oh. education, etc. And you're doing that already, aren't exactly. you? Exactly. Yes, we are. Um, and yeah, we're well blessed in Croydon uh, with the integrated approach that we've had for many years that definitely helps with these sorts of issues. That's added to uh, with the education side. So we've got uh, uh, London South Bank uh, have now got a location in the borough as well as Croydon College. Um, uh, so there are lots of opportunities for us to work across that broader public sector. So it's not just health and care, uh, education uh, and other parts of the public sector are equally important. Uh, and uh, as I say, I think that will mark out those organisations that uh, uh, who get that will, will, will get more success going forward. And are you seeing just anecdotally um, an energy and enthusiasm amongst the younger generation for health and social care? It's certainly been in front of their minds over the pandemic, etc. I think so. Yeah, if you look at the numbers mm. of applications, etc., it would demonstrate that there is enthusiasm and excitement out there. The, our job, in one sense, is to to, to use that enthusiasm uh, and then make sure that once people are in the system, whether that be in a training program or in a job that they feel like they're being well looked after and they want to stay um, because the idea of it sometimes is better than the reality for some people and that's why people leave and we have to be honest about that it's a tough job working in health and care uh, it's also an amazing job it's a massive privilege to do it uh, and I feel that every day after even after 30 odd years I still get the same enthusiasm for it but it is challenging uh, and so we've got to make sure that people know that but also that we're looking after people well uh, and they feel that they can make that positive contribution because then the opportunities are limitless uh, to work in health and care uh, and we just need to make that clear to people and then they will stay and they'll have fantastic careers and make a huge contribution to where they work and the country as a whole. Absolutely. Um, one final question just stepping back further there's uh, obviously an imperative for greater productivity, there's uh, funding, all of these levers and again, drawing on your vast experience um, one of the things that are going to need to be uh, looked at is population health and turning the dial on the disparity in uh, health inequalities. That's part of your strategic outcome in terms of the five-year plan. It's a huge question, but just some of the things that perhaps you're seeing that are giving you hope or some of the initiatives, because education, housing, these de wider determinants are going to be vital if the NHS is going to deliver the quality of care at scale that it needs. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, I mean, I, j just quickly, mm. a couple of things that we're doing mm. and that does give me some heart. Uh, the first is we're doing a big programme in Croydon, uh, strengthening communities uh, together, uh, a piece of work actually with the King's Fund, which is between the statutory agencies and the voluntary sector to look at how we can really get close to uh, the communities that we serve uh, and leverage the benefit and a huge opportunity that voluntary sector uh, gives us to absolutely get into those deprived communities to say what does that community need how can we best help what can the voluntary sector do what can the statutory sector do so there's a, there's a big opportunity uh, there i think uh, that helps uh, address uh, health inequalities we're also in southwest london mm. um, 
with some funding that's available and it's not only about money but resources does make a difference. Um, we're looking with two schemes uh, around health inequalities and health innovation funding to, to balance that uh, and to spread it into areas where the deprivation is greater. So to you know not just do it on a per head of population basis but to spread that out into areas where uh, the need is greatest and obviously f- living in and wor- working in Croydon mm. that's really important mm. because the levels mm. of need in deprivation terms and health need is very significant in Croydon and in the past we may have got a fair share in terms of population heads what we now need to do is make sure we get a fair share in terms of the need because that will then really help us to start to address the fundamentals and the differences that exist between populations across the capital uh, because we can get more resource to do more for the populations that need that help more so than others. And that's not to uh, underplay the importance of health everywhere. There is health need in every part of London. Uh, It's just that uh, the health need is different and more acute in some parts than others and we certainly feel that in Croydon and South West London as an integrated care uh, board is working with us and helping to try to get that funding to match where that need is and I think that's a really positive step and one that I'm keen to obviously uh, to pursue. Well, on that positive note, I'd like to thank you, Matthew Kershaw, for your time and your candour and your wisdom. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you very much. And if you've enjoyed this episode of Voices of Care, please like, follow or subscribe wherever you receive your podcasts. And if you want to find out about how we are truly enabling the healthcare workforce of the future, please visit newcrosshealthcare.com forward slash Voices of Care. In the meantime, I'm Sahel Mirza. Thank you and look forward to seeing you on the next episode.